<laughs> Thanks, everyone. We're now recording. Okay. So I was just saying, I was standing in for Catherine Ferguson, and uh, she got called up to be on the Biden Harris transition team. And so uh, apparently, she's pretty busy uh, at this point. And so uh, I got the call to uh, to come in and uh, sit in for for Catherine. You may know that she, other than being the recent associate director of the Community Strategy Group, used to be a chief of staff for the Domestic Policy Council in the Obama White House. So she's going back in and going to help out at the national level. I'm uh, what I've done is I've uh, retired a couple of years ago from the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities as a vice president there. And uh, at the endowment, I was involved in running some programs, including the Forest Investment Zones Program and the, uh, Af the uh, Sustainable Forestry and African American Land Retention Program there at the endowment and uh, got me involved in the work we're talking about today. Also with us is uh, Clifford Deaton. And uh, Clifford uh, is going to be running the technology for us. Uh, but, but beyond that, uh, he's a program associate at the Aspen Community Strategies Group and co-chair of the Institute's Green Team. Also, he's a master in modern communications, which is why we hope we'll actually stay up and be able to function through this program. But uh, even more than that, he brings a sort of sense of how to, how to use media and, and communications to further social justice and economic development. So we appreciate um, Clifford's participation today. But our main, main folks we're gonna look at here are our panelists, Josh Walton and Thomas Mitchell. Josh Walden is the uh, Chief Operating Officer of the Center for Air's Property Preservation in Charleston, South Carolina, that if you've been with us today, you've heard a lot about. Um, he's licensed to practice in South Carolina, and uh, his specialty is a real property, estate planning, and probate law. And those come in pretty handy because Josh, over the last 11 years, has uh, led uh, the Center's uh, legal program, which is one of the largest and most effective projects dealing with individual families and heirs property law problems. Um, and he's, so he's, I think he emerges as one of our leading experts on that direct services component of dealing with uh, heirs property uh, across the nation. So uh, we appreciate you being with us today, Josh. And secondly, we'll have, uh, we'll hear from Thomas Mitchell. And Thomas is a professor at law at Texas A&M University. And there he co-directs a program on real estate and community development law. Uh, professor Mitchell came to A&M from the University of Wisconsin, where he was a full professor with a chair in law. Um, we know Thomas Moore as a champion for heirs property owners, and he's done a lot of work and extensive scholarship on the issues, and is having a major impact, impact on the public policy around this issue. Most notably, if you're around earlier today, too, you heard that he was a principal drafter and all-around champion of the Uniform Partition Act an effort that we've now seen enacted in 18 states and I think one of the, and, uh, and the Virgin Islands. Uh, you'll hear more about that, of course, from Thomas in a minute. Apparently the MacArthur Foundation also heard about Thomas's work and have uh, awarded him a 2020 MacArthur Fellowship. So we, uh, it's a pretty big deal and we, uh, congratulations, Thomas. We we're all celebrate with you. And I think that not only says uh, how smart Thomas is, but also says how important people see this issue. And, uh, and has raised that up on a national level through Thomas. So we appreciate that. Uh, just a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Um, we, uh, we've got kind of a large group in the session today, so we're uh, gonna keep you on mute and we would like you, but we do wanna spend a good bit of this session answering questions and bringing your comments in. So Clifford's gonna monitor the, the uh, we're using the uh, chat box, right Clifford? That's right. Go ahead and put your questions as they, as they come to you into the chat. Um, uh, Josh and Thomas and Alan will be able to see those, uh, but if they're not moderating when it comes to it, Alan, just go ask, hey, is there some questions in the chat box? And I'll try to um, deal, group them together if possible, if there's some similar questions, uh, but also take them in the order in which they, they came in. And there seems there also always has to be a caveat here. This one is that... Um, that Thomas and Josh uh, have limited resources. <laughs> and sometimes in these public spaces, uh, uh, people have individual questions about their own legal situations and we're unable to address those individual uh, questions today. We're gonna be more broad in our discussion. Uh, so we're not gonna take questions about individual legal situations that you might be facing. And also uh, outside of the region of the Center for Air's Property Preservation in South Carolina where they serve 
neither Thomas nor Josh can really have the capacity to address uh, specific legal questions directly uh, in their capacities where they are. So um, we'll try and uh, give some perspective on where people might begin to search for, for answers today. But uh, just know that they're not going to be able to respond to you about those things unless you're in Josh's area here in South Carolina. Um, okay, uh, Josh, I think you're going to lead off. All right. Thank you, Alan. Uh, um, I know we have a limited time, so this is a high level view. I uh, want to discuss direct legal services, the impact of direct legal services on heirs' property. Um, and from the center's perspective, it's really about protecting and preventing and resolving heirs' property issues and, and ultimately promoting sustainable use uh, of family land. Uh, that impact should hopefully equate to uh, more security and an economic benefit, turning what may be considered a liability into an asset. And invariably, when you're doing that and you're, you're, you're attacking that problem, the heirs property issue, you're going to need attorneys. Uh, there's no, there's generally no way around that. Uh, um, I could tell you over the, over the course of 15 years, I've been with the center since 2009 uh, as an attorney, so, uh, handled cases and, and certainly um, now as a COO overseeing the departments, one of those being the legal department, the center has developed and implemented a, a sort of holistic approach to delivering direct legal services to heirs, property, families, and communities. Uh, and, and by holistic, uh, I mean that when we're attacking the problem and the associated land loss that, that comes with that problem more often than not, uh, whether that be through gentrification, predatory development, more rural settings, tax sales, um, even intra-family dynamics that can lead to forced partition sales. Uh, the center has always addressed not only the need for a trusted and reliable legal resource, i.e. an attorney for these families in these communities, but also the uh, social factors and the, uh, the family dynamic issues that invariably rise. Uh, it, it, it shares sort of the framework or the best practices model of the way the center uh, addresses these issues and, ha and has done so successfully in, a, in, a, in an area where success is, is not that common. Uh, uh, it's a multifaceted problem and the center has always employed a multifaceted approach and strategy to doing this. And it's really broken down into three components, education and trust building, uh, prevention and resolution. Education and trust building. Uh, there's no way around the need to build partnerships within the communities you're going to serve. Uh, the need to be vetted. It's not only a need, it's a requirement. Ultimately, to build the trust required to be a resource to the folks that you're looking to assist, you need to be vetted by the community gatekeepers. Uh, building partnerships and earning trust, and it's hard won and it's easily lost, as, as is the case very often. These partnerships, eventually, you will be, you'll be recognized, whether it be the organization or the individual attorney, recognized as someone that can be trusted. Not only insofar as your trust, what you say is true, what your, your intentions are, are true. Uh, and there's, there's, a, there's a flip or, or there's a transition at one point to where you go from that to being someone who can be trusted to being a trusted resource within the community. And, and, and what comes with that are referrals. What comes with that are proactively uh, the community reaching out to you as an attorney or you as the organization and wanting you to come and speak at family reunions, at church socials, at community events, and being there and referring. And Miss Johnson at the by to you because she knows they have a tax issue or they have a, an heirs property issue. Uh, ultimately, the two other components again revolve around that they both require the access to trusted and affordable legal services for a landowner. Absent that, you can educate someone and you can engender that trust and you can become a resource, but until you provide the tools uh, whereby folks can prevent the problem or address the problem, you can only, you can only affect the issue to, to a certain degree. Uh, prevention, and, and this personally is where I think most hay is made on this issue, um, estate planning and succession planning. Uh, you're not only talking about uh, primarily uh, in our region, it's, it's Gullah African-American landowner and family landowner, and, and what are you doing to plan for estate, uh, for, for your death? Uh, wills are a key component to this, where the center 
the center has uh, multiple free wills clinics in the community. We go out to the community with the center attorneys and trusted uh, attorney volunteers. And on a Saturday, we draft wills all day. Um, and today, when someone has a will, they're more likely to administer the, the estate of the individual. The individual's estate is more likely to be administered and, and, and avoid that, that, that unclear title problem that you have. Uh, the resolution component, if we're talking about multi-generational heirs property, if we're talking about two, three, four, five generations, um, the direct legal services to, to resolve those issues. Uh, they're going to need attorney for purposes of a quiet title action, uh, a partition in kind action if the family's agreed to divide the property. And, and a key component to this is um, mediation. Uh, I can tell you that the center since 2005 has resolved roughly 278 title issues and the tax assessed value of that land is $16.4 million. And almost without exception, every one of those cases involved mediation. Nobody came to the table with an agreement. Uh, I've, I've been involved in a lot of cases where I met with different poor down actually and we and three years later we've resolved the issue now but but mediation is a key component to success in, in any kind of endeavor when you're talking about attacking the heirs property Josh we got some problems with your zoom there your connection just give them just a second Well, Josh? Can you? Are you back with us, Josh? I'm I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can now. So we lost okay. probably your last few minutes there. Okay. Um, well, the the idea of um, of mediation being a key component to the work. I don't know if you got that part, but we did. okay, good. Um at the end of the day. The center takes this holistic approach and the attorneys take this holistic approach. And that's whether we're going into a community or whether we are engaging a family for purposes of representation. Um, this approach is simply put necessary because that's what you need to be effective consistently. Uh, engaging the community, engendering trust, keeping that trust, and, and, and providing the direct legal services to attack the issue. Outside of that, um, it's going to be piecemeal. It's going to be piecemeal. The successes are going to be, uh, and I know every state doesn't have the ability to have attorneys on staff with a nonprofit. I understand that. Uh, but at some point there's going to have to be a legal direct legal services component to any organization or any attempt to, to, uh, attack the issue of heirs property and, 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 uh, land preservation. And, and I will say this, if any. <laughs> available via the web. Josh, you're broken up again. Can you re restate what you just said? All right. Sure. Just saying that my email is available via the center website. If someone uh, wants to have a, a more in, de in detailed discussion. Clifford, we have a question. Is there, is there a way to deal with that at this point? Sure. I think actually Josh is the right person to uh, answer that one uh, from Watson Fennell Jr. You, you answer, he has a lot of questions there in the chat. Um, I think you answered some of those about mediation, but um, specifically about leasing land. Um, does the center... Uh, support uh, landowners who might be considering different types of leases? What are the pros and cons of leasing land? Sure. Uh, the center, uh, any, anytime someone comes in and engages with an attorney, we've dealt with folks who, uh, who as a mechanism for earning some sort of income, depending on the, the, uh, the particular facts of a particular uh, family situation, uh, we have dealt with that in the past. What I would suggest would be uh, uh, is it from Mr. Fennell. Uh, if Mr. Fennell will contact the center, he can certainly uh, speak to an attorney. The devil's always in the details, and to answer a question like that without a good 30 to 40 minutes of a, of a discussion would, be, uh, would not be wise. Great, thank you. Thomas, I think we're, we're up for you. Okay. Okay. 
so uh, so welcome. I'm going to try to uh, do my presentation by going through uh, a PowerPoint with just know, six or seven slides. So uh, Cliff, are you going to upload that for me? Share that. All right, you, you can go to the uh, to the next screen. So when I just want to, as context, when I started on this work, you know, 23, 24 years ago, the consensus among a lot of law professors, lawyers, other stakeholders was that um, as sad as it was, heirs property owners were just destined to, for, distinct, for extinction, that nothing could be done in a law and policy to uh, assist these owners. Um, and primarily because they were viewed as owners who fundamentally lacked access to political power, economic power, and had little social capital. You know, so I think that, you know, my work at the beginning, more than 20 years ago, is I tried to look and take the long view and think of solutions that um, maybe wouldn't even be implemented in my lifetime, but at least would begin to kind of build out some law and policy kind of solutions. Um, I mean, I'm thrilled that I, I often describe this as the golden age for heirs property in terms of the academic and other research, um, just far more than there used to be. And there's been a, a far greater and more robust uh, interest among stakeholders in terms of law and policy solutions. So I'm principally going to start talking that uh, some solutions at the state level. Um, as, as was kind of indicated, I was the principal drafter of the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property um, Act an act designed to give heirs property owners enhanced private property rights and to be able to protect their real estate wealth. So I'm not gonna assume that everybody in this session was also in the plenary. So I don't know if, um, uh, Clifford, can you click on the link, the hyperlink for the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act? So, you know, from that background where it was assumed, and can you scroll up where you can see the whole map of the United States. So, you know, more than 20 years later, um, you know, we've kind of defied the, the odds. So it, and, uh, instead of being a total failure, we have 17 states that have enacted it into law and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, can you see the map? Really, yeah, yeah. What's really confounded people is in about 20 years ago or so, folks Folks, their initial thing was that this will be a total failure. And then sometimes they hedge and they say, well, you might get a couple of states, but certainly there'll be no Southern states. Turns out that the South is leading the way. Eight of the 17 states are in the South, including one that I even thought we would not have a chance for, for you know, three decades. And that would be the great state of Mississippi. So, you know, and we're not done yet. You know, I, I've been telling people, I think that we'll get up to 25 state adoptions by the year 2025. And we have a number of states where we're actively engaged. We're working with all kinds of coalitions and stakeholders in that kind of like bottom up and top down way. Um, all right, so if you can get out of that, that hyperlink, um, Clifford, and go back to the original slide. As a, as a result of some of this, the, the totally unexpected success of the Uniform Partition of Various Property Act, the organization that was responsible for promulgating it um, has, I, I was able to convince them to take on a second uh, model state statute project, and this is this Tenancy in Common Ownership Default Study Committee. The problem is if you are a tenant in common and you find out that this heirs property ownership is incredibly unstable and it doesn't allocate rights and responsibilities, you basically, it, many families are trapped into it because to restructure their ownership into a limited liability company or some other structure, you need a hundred percent agreement. And that's often nearly impossible. So what's nice is that we've now kind of broken through it, that the, hopefully the Uniform Partition Act will not be a one-off. It will generate other state reforms, whether the one I'm talking to you about or others. We, we have an example in Texas where at the local level, we got a state statute passed in 2019 that gives heirs property owners who are owner occupiers of a, their, of a residential property, um, it, it greatly improves their ability to claim the homestead exemption, which is kind of an anti-gentrification, anti-displacement tool. Uh, Clifford, can you go to the next slide? Great. So just, just quickly, uh, there's three major features of the Uniform Partition Act. One is that if there's one of the common owners that seeks a forced sale, the other owners who want to maintain ownership of the property are then entitled to buy out that fellow co-owner um, for the fair market value of that fractional interest. 
Second, the law in many states had discounted or given no value to families' claims that the property had importance to them for its heritage, cultural, or historic value, or because the property was a basic source of shelter and that without that property, their quality of, of shelter or housing would severely decline, maybe even ending up in homelessness. The, we we uh, remade the test to then build in both economic and economic, non-economic factors like the ones I just mentioned. And lastly, most of these partition sales before had been what we call sheriff sales or auction sales, which resulted in buyer sale prices where the property would sell for substantially below its fair market value. So the family not only lost the property, then they were stripped of a significant amount of their wealth in the process. So especially if you're talking about African-Americans or Latinos, their asset portfolios are disproportionately uh, consist of their real property holdings. Um, and so we now have a, a, a procedure in place that is designed to produce something approaching or uh, a fair market value price. And we've already had a lot of evidence that that's working. Can you get the next slide? So the, so not only then have we had um, activity in the space of state law or state statutes, the, in 2018, the federal farm bill included these provisions of this Fair Access for Farmers and Ranchers Act of uh, 2018, which was co-sponsored by, on the Senate side, by Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina and Senator Doug Jones uh, from Alabama, who really was the driver behind this act. It has enhanced benefits for heirs property owners, enabling them to participate with much more effectiveness in a variety of USDA programs from lending to disaster assistance to conservation. It also provides as a pilot program to enable families to restructure, the, to, to, to get a loan on good terms so that they can restructure their ownership into something that is a much more stable form and they can get a will or estate plan. So I mentioned in the plenary that there's a massive racial uh, will making and estate planning gap in the United States overall figures is 24% of African Americans have a will, whereas 64% of white American families have a will. There's also a provision of the Farm Bill that we've really been able to, to utilize in the last couple of years in the advocacy for the Uniform Partition Act. Essentially, that, that provision in the Farm Bill says that states that pass the Uniform Partition Act, uh, family farmers and ranchers who own heirs properties in those states are entitled to a greater set of USDA benefits than farmers and ranchers who own heirs property in other states. And, as a direct result of that provision, we've been able to get the Uniform Partition Act enacted into law in Illinois, Florida, Mississippi, and um, uh, Virginia. Uh, next slide. Okay, so just a couple things. There's, there, there's multiple problems with heirs' property ownership. I mentioned the instability, and that's what the Partition Act tries to address. I, I, address this issue of gridlocked ownership, where these families get locked into this form of ownership. Um, and then there's the clear title problem. So without having clear title to your property, you're ineligible for a wide range of commercial loans where you need uh, your property as collateral. And you're also not entitled to participation in a, in a wide range of state and federal programs, um, including programs in the USDA, FEMA, HUD, uh, and in many state agencies, and I have a hyperlink if we, anybody wants to have share this uh, PowerPoint afterwards in Georgia, this is their Department of Community Affairs that was providing funding for uh, families that had dilapidated homes. And there ended up being a number of African American families that, that tried to apply. Unfortunately, they had heirs property, they lacked clear title, and then they were denied the ability to participate. Can I get the next slide? I think I just have a couple left. Um, so one of the, at a policy level, and this was mentioned by Cassandra uh, in the uh, plenary, there's a critical lack of data on heirs property ownership, on uh, property ownership among disadvantaged property owners generally. It, it's in terms of the overall amount of farmland, um, air, the amount of heirs property owners. And it's critical that we enhance this data collection and analysis if we're gonna have informed law and policy development and I'll just tell you the fact that there was such poor data on uh, black agricultural landship overall almost resulted in the Uniform Partition Act not being drafted at all. The ag census showed that there was almost no black farmland um, that was owned in 1997. And the organization that promulgated the Uniform Partition Act basically said, it's too late. 
there's, there's too few of these owners. And I had to say, no, 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 there's this other data source where the USDA did a broader sample of agricultural landowners, whether or not they had an active farm operation. And that's the only thing that the census of agricultural captures is land owned by people who have active farm operations. It turns out a lot of African-Americans that we saw in the video before, they own agricultural land, but they're not using it for active farm operation. You know, sometimes they're just letting it lie fallow. Sometimes they're renting it out to somebody else, but that's not captured in the USDA. So we, so it's critical um, that at the state and federal level that we get enhanced data collection and analysis. And I think I just have one last slide. And you know, this is kind of you know, uh, this is kind of an obvious point to many. There's just heirs property owners have a critical lack of access to affordable legal services, right? Just ask Josh. I'm sure Josh, uh, the Center for Heirs Property Preservation is not able to help 100% of the people that need their help, right? But at least South Carolina has the Center for Heirs Property Preservation. There's only one of that has something similar, uh, and that's Georgia. Um, so most heirs property owners just don't have access to that. So there's roles that the federal, state, government can play, foundations can play a, a role, law firms and lawyers and private practice can play a role. And the last thing I, I also say is if we're limiting it to African-Americans for a second, which is heirs property owners are disproportionately African-Americans, but not exclusively. Um, you know, you have this problem is we have an insufficient supply of black lawyers in this country. 13 and a half percent of the population is African-American, only 5% of lawyers in America are African-American, and only a, a very small percentage of the African-American lawyers have practice in areas that implicate wealth building or wealth preservation, right? In terms of real estate, wills, trust in the states, tax. Um, and African-American lawyers tend to be overrepresented in areas like criminal law, which is we, we need criminal lawyers, but we have so few black lawyers who have this skill set to help uh, uh, heirs property owners and other disadvantaged property owners in their communities. So I think I'll end on that. So Clifford, it looks like we've got some questions coming up. I want to before I want to ask one to follow up on what Thomas was uh, talking about, and you talking about you know it's important to get data and it's about the the acreage or the number of properties held by people in heirs property. But there's also this question of value and economic potential, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you have any sense, uh, Josh or Thomas, what the scale of the economic uh, asset is that sort that's not being utilized effectively because of heirs property? I mean, just in general, is yeah. it a small amount or is it enormous? I mean, I've seen some studies that we're talking about the tens of billions of dollars. Yeah. Um, so those are um, some of the studies I've seen. And uh, some of them were, there was a study in a couple counties in Alabama that showed uh, the potential of that land. Um, but because of problems of clear title, for example, how those uh, property owners weren't able to leverage their ownership to deliver on uh, some of the benefits of, of, of that ownership. So, you know, so I, I think we're talking in the tens of billions of dollars. But just one other thing in terms of securing that ownership, I'm part of a, a research study with four other amazing researchers um, We've been looking at the economic impact of black land loss in the last hundred years and our conservative estimate in terms of the land that has been lost uh, is $350 billion. And we're building on that study um, to go beyond just the value of the land to then say, well, if you're, if you own land, you can then, if you have clear title, you could use the land to, as collateral to get a loan to put your kids into college. And there's a variety of other factors that are going to likely result in adding hundreds of billions of dollars to that estimate. Yeah, and Alan, the uh, just from the 278 cases that we've resolved since 05, $16.4 million in tax assessed value. That's not appraised value, that's tax assessed value, which is invariably lower. All that, that amount of leverage was unavailable prior to clearing title. And, uh, and, and as, as Thomas mentioned, the idea of leveraging that for purposes of, of building a home uh, instead of being relegated to manufactured housing that doesn't require clear title and the high interest loans associated with that. Um, yeah, uh, the, uh, just from a, a microcosm of, of what the center's done, it, it's, it's a substantial uh, impact on, on the resources a family and a community have. 
you think about future earnings there on land that's unleashed like this, and you're talking about not impact just on families, but on whole communities economically. Yep. Is that safe to say? Definitely. Yeah. Yes. There's no doubt about that. No. Clifford, you got some, looks like you got some great questions. In there, there are some great questions in here. I'm going to try to group a few of them together under a big broad category of geographic and, uh, and community differences. So uh, Kip asked about, uh, you know, what are the bra barriers to getting the Uniform Partition Act adopted in different parts of the country? Brenda has asked about Native Americans and trust status. And then there's a final, uh, another question from uh, Garrett about how it's different in urban places like Washington, D.C. versus rural communities. I'll say, so just in terms of, I take the long view. So remember, like when I started, you know, I, I can't tell you the number of people who told me, you will totally fail. There will not be a single state. So um, of all the uniform real property acts, this uniform law commission has promulgated, it's been about 40 in 128 years. The median number of states to enact their Uniform Real Property Acts is one. And I basically told them 20 years ago, uh, back in 2010, if we get one, I'm claiming success. So, you know, we've had a lot of success, but that success is building momentum. Um, you know, I think that uh, the, in the places where we've faced opposition, it actually, it, didn't, it hasn't come from where I thought. I thought it was gonna be organizations representing real estate developers never materialized. What I kind of came to realize is that's not a good poster child for that industry, right? Even though these developers technically were following the law. The, the, our primary roadblock in the places where we've had roadblocks has been from lawyers or the bar. And that hasn't been uniform. Some states, the real estate lawyers and real property lawyers have been very helpful and supportive and endorsed. But uh, in North Carolina, for example, we uh, that's one of the roadblocks. Now, we now have eight states, you know, in the South, we have the, um, we have the tool of the farm bill, which, you know, we had some real battles in 2020. I would describe the efforts I was engaged in, in, uh, in Florida as being in a knife fight because the Florida bar opposed it and initially the Virginia bar opposed it too. Um, but we ended up prevailing. So the, I think the key thing going forward is we have built really amazing. It's, it's been a really amazing combination of top down, in terms of elite organizations like the ABA, this Uniform Law Commission, but also bottom up. And we've had an amazing coalitions that have come in. Uh, I worked with an amazing one this past year in Virginia and Florida. We've had amazing, there's a woman in Arkansas, Karana Neal, who we worked with, who took a really grassroots approach. So, you know, I'm very uh, eager to work with folks who want to work as part of a coalition and a team. So that's that. Let me just quickly address um, the urban issue. Um, I, I, I was telling people for you know years that heirs property is not a southern rural African American problem. If you look at the drivers, the drivers are low rates of, of will making and estate planning. The uh, people who are low income or low wealth, people whose property is uh, in areas that are rapidly appreciating in value, and folks who lack access to affordable legal services. If you look at each one of those individual elements, nothing screams rural or urban. That is cross-cutting. And for years, I could not break through. I, I'd talk to, I'd be interviewed by a lot of media establishments, and I'd tell them that, and then the article would come out as heirs property is a Southern rural African-American problem. <laughs> Until last year, or two, in 2019, an investigative reporter with a major television station in New York City, NY1, uh, did an investigative report, discovered that real estate speculators were preying upon African-American families in New York City in almost every borough or every part, Harlem, Queens, Brooklyn, um, who owned heirs' property. Um, and as a result of that investigative report, we went from having been totally stonewalled in New York among people in the legislature and other powerful stakeholders to within a week of that airing, there was almost a competition among members of the legislature to see who could introduce our bill first. And it passed in record time. Um, I was just, it, was, it rocketed through the New York legislature. So that's an urban example. And right now I'm working with uh, some people in the District of Columbia who, um, who, who are very interested in getting it uh, enacted in the law. So, you know, the, the only difference I'd say in the urban versus rural context is if you have a single family home in an urban area, the chances that that, that property can be physically divided is slim to none. 
right? So, you know, at that point, we're talking about preventing a partition action or ensuring that the, if there's a for sale, it uh, returns a fair price, a price at fair market value or approximating that. And then if either of you could speak to the uh, Native American uh, land and, and trust, um, land that's held in trust. Yeah, Josh, I could talk about that, but if, but if you want to. So, you know, the Native American, the, the key thing is in trust, right? So there, there are Native Americans who own heirs property that are, that is not in trust, that is governed or is otherwise governed by state law. So there's a statute that I think the federal government approved in Oklahoma. So for the five quote unquote civilized tribes in Oklahoma, state partition law actually applies to those families. But in terms of trust land, it presents similar, it's kind of a similar phenomenon, but it manifests itself differently. So there's not so much of an issue of instability because under the trust status, um, usually one person cannot then petition that Indian trust land that's kind of heirs property be sold. Um, but it presents lots of problems in terms of being highly fractionated, uh, the clear title problem, not being able to leverage it for wealth. Um, so one of the things kind of going forward is I'm very interested in working with groups um, or researchers that are working on the Native American fractionated problem uh, collaboratively to see, are there lessons learned from each of our comparative experiences that can inform the other group? And are there ways that we can work collaboratively? Um, you know, in addition to, as I indicated in states like Oklahoma, where actually the heirs property situation is very much like the heirs property situation uh, elsewhere. Uh, I think we got some, another question, but Josh, I want to direct one to you, which is um, we're going back to provision of direct legal services. What do you think the primary inhibitors are for families uh, being able to actually engage in uh, addressing the problem of heirs' property? Well, the uh, some of the consistent hurdles we see with with heirs' property owners and families coming through the door, uh, one. Uh, obviously is a lack of resources, the costs associated, even if you have, even if you reach full agreement, even if you find everyone, even if you, uh, if you, uh, if you're on the precipice of bringing the quiet title action to resolve the title uh, in accord with a, with a, a mutual agreement, the costs associated of a title search on a multi-generational heirs property track, the costs of uh, an associated survey, uh, the, the court costs. Uh, these are all outside the costs associated if you are paying an attorney. Folks who come to the center, they're not paying an attorney, but there are costs associated with the process. So cost, it, it, cost is something that does not disappear because you have a free legal service agency. So it's something that is, uh, that is definitely problematic. And also uh, the family dynamic. Uh, we all have family and, and uh, there's, there are, there, there are many, uh, nuances to, to reaching that agreement. You have folks who live on the land, folks who are originally, uh, who live on the land, who pay the taxes. You've got folks who are off site, folks who are in other states, uh, folks who have never met each other. Uh, you have a wide range of uh, backgrounds, a wide range of education levels. You have a wide range of um, socioeconomic status. I, uh, I've got cases where, you know, some of the heirs have doctorates, they're attorneys, they're, they're physicians, and then some who, who, uh, who maybe had to drop out of school to help support their family. I mean, just real life cases. And that dynamic uh, can, can come into play when folks are deciding what's in the best interest of everyone, particularly if you have folks who are living on the land who have more to lose. Uh, if you've got 50 acres and you've got 150 heirs, there's not going to be a partition where everyone gets a, a piece to park a bicycle on. There's going to have to be some sort of agreement. And some look at it as a, a means to maybe secure income, whether that be forestry or, or uh, uh, ag or, or ecotourism or conservation easements. And some folks won't, simply want their piece cut off so they can build a home and, and raise a family and pass that particular track on to their, to their loved ones. So, uh, the cost and then just the overall dynamic of, and, and the continued pressures. Um, this idea that, you know, gentrification only occurs in urban areas or, 
or in town, uh, the advent, we're running out of property. So, so uh, predatory development continues to, to uh, encroach on to more and more uh, uh, rural landscapes and, and that pressure raises. And then you were, you're looking at raised tax assessments as, as new things come into play. So there are pressures that, that come about and very often we see folks come through the door when there's an issue, when there's been a natural disaster and they're attempting to get home repair via FEMA or some state or local organization that requires clear title. So um, uh, all those things come to bear, but particularly costs and the family dynamic and the need to navigate that in order to, because ultimately you're gonna need agreement to protect the land, period. I don't care if you're in front of a judge and it's heirs property, if you're there without an agreement, you're in some degree of danger, you're in some degree of vulnerability to a forced partition sale, regardless of the act or not. Uh, that's why every one of those 278 cases went after a mediated agreement was, was realized. Just got a couple minutes. So uh, Clifford, what you got in the question? We've got some um, great questions. I'm sorry that we won't be able to get to all of them, but we've got uh, three questions I think related to federal level policy in the farm bill. Um, you know, what, what, what are the changes in the, in the next iteration of the farm bill that can, you know, help support, uh, you know, policy levers that are going to then trickle down to actual people on the ground, um, you know, and then, you know, what's the difference of about, you know, like, what's the advantage of, of taking action at the federal level versus taking level at taking action at the state level? And then, uh, uh, and then a third question, which came in quite early, I'm glad we're able to get to it is, you know, what are some other policy levers? What are some other ways that policy can be put? You know, if you could dream big, uh, you know, what are the big policy changes that you would make uh, to uh, impact uh, the, uh, the, this problem? Yeah, so like I said, this, I think this is the golden age of issues of heirs property, of uh, property for, um, African American farmers, and I'm not sure it's been introduced. It's either going to be introduced today or tomorrow, so I'm not. I'm kind of embargoed from telling you. But they're going to let me just tell you. There's a major, major bill that is either being introduced. Maybe it got introduced in the last couple hours, or it'll be introduced tomorrow um, by a U.S. senator who ran for president this year. That's all. I, I, you know, I don't want to get in trouble. So uh, take a look at, at that bill. Um, which to me is one of the most wide ranging, substantial, robust bills to address a variety of issues dealing with, um, you know, disadvantaged uh, owner of agricultural land, black farmers, black landowners. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Um, you know, so, you know, uh, these, these bills kind of implicate folks who have been um, pushed out of farming, oftentimes because of discrimination. Uh, it uh, implicates folks who want to get into farming but don't have a lot of experience. Uh, it addresses issues of civil rights in terms of the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture and their kind of history of systemic discrimination against um, uh, farmers of color and women. Um, so it's, and it addresses this data issue that I mentioned, right? So just keep an eye out for that. Um, so I, I think that for me, it's not either a state or a federal. It's got to be a both and approach. And what I think was great about the Farm Bill is it um, had federal benefits in the USDA, but it had that feature of what I call cooperative federalism that incentivized states to take action at the state level. Um, that might actually be the most successful part of that Farm Bill now because some of the other provisions in that Farm Bill, the USDA has been dragging its feet. Um, and so we need to keep the USDA's uh, feet uh, to the fire uh, on those. Um, the last thing I just wanted to mention, and somebody asked the escrow about urban versus rural, two great, um, two great investigative reports. One from New York City with that issue I just guide you. If you want to Google it, it's called Going, Going, Gone. Um, and then there was one done by Vice. So if you look up Vice News and YouTube and put in losing ground, they did an amazing investigative report of partition abuse in rural Louisiana. Um, so I just highly recommend those as a resource. Josh, you got some closing comments about those questions? 
Um, no, I mean, at the end of the day, the, uh, the urban versus rural component to heirs property, we see just as many folks, if not more, that own five acres or less than we own than folks who own over 20 acres. So it's not just a, a rural landscape issue by any stretch of the imagination. Thanks, everybody. So this is the conclusion of the first of our two breakout rooms. And um, uh, uh, there's been a bunch of questions in the chat about uh, like pretty specific uh, answer stuff. Are there organizations working in Virginia or DC or Texas on this issue? And we'll do our best to share out the chat with some further resources, just I think like, like Janet Topolsky mentioned in the um, in the overview session, but we've got a 15 minute break and I encourage you to click one of those other links in the agenda and join a, a different breakout room. You are theoretically welcome to stick around here and talk with Thomas and Josh again um, and hear the presentation one more time, but uh, there's more to learn, especially related to some of the questions that I saw asked. I think you're going to get a lot out of the other breakout sessions. So, um, and that will, that second breakout session will be begin at 445. So you've got about 15 minutes uh, to stretch your legs. Thank you, Josh and Thomas. Thank you. And uh, you think with the number of people we have now, we can open up the sound? Um, and, have, and have folks ask their own questions. It's, yeah. it's fine by me. Um, why don't we, um, you know, if you do have a question, go ahead and uh, as, our, as our panelists uh, uh, um, share some more lessons today, go ahead and put them into the chat and Alan, we can, we can just ask, uh, you know, call on that person to unmute and, and ask their okay. question. That sounds good, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we could, we may get more people here quickly and that would mean we'd have to go back to our more <laughs> sterile. <laughs> we'll be flexible. <laughs> yeah. So I guess we're close. Ready, Clifford? All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Legal and Policy Approaches breakout for this great day, and we uh, welcome all of you. Um, I'm Alan McGregor. I'm going to be your moderator for this session. Uh, I am doing that with great humility because I'm replacing Catherine Ferguson, who was uh, up until a few days ago the Associate Director of the Community Strategies Group at the Aspen Institute, and she's been called away to be on the Biden-Harris transition team, and uh, apparently she was a little bit busy, so she's uh, asked, <laughs> asked me to step in and do that. Um, uh, but Catherine, you may know, was uh, at one was going back into the transition team from being in Chief of Staff with the Domestic Policy Council under the Obama administration, so we're glad she's doing the good work, and uh, I'm glad to be able to step in and help out. So I'm Alan McGregor, and I um, am recently retired from the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, where I was a vice president and uh, ran some uh, larger projects like the Forest Investment Zones program there, as well as the Sustainable Forestry and African American Land Retention Program, um, which got me involved with some of the characters here you're, uh, you're seeing today uh, throughout this, this, this presentation uh, throughout the day. Um, Clifford Deaton is also here, and Clifford is a program associate with the, um, the, the uh, community strategies group there at Aspen, and he's uh, beyond trying to keep us straight technically during this session and also keeping your questions managed. Uh, Clifford is a great communications person with good skills and uh, how to use communications for social justice and social change, and so we're glad to have him on the team. But uh, mainly I want to introduce our panelists for the day. And uh, those are Josh Walden and Thomas Mitchell. 
And Josh is uh, the chief operating officer at the, at the Center for Airs Property Preservations. And so happy birthday, happy anniversary there, Josh, for the, for the center. We're celebrating that today, among other things. Um, Josh is uh, licensed in the bar for South Carolina. Uh, he is a um, specialist in real property, estate planning, and uh, probate law. And that's uh, convenient. He has those skills because for the last 11 years, Josh has been building a, a practice of law within the center for clients that have heirs property uh, in order to deal with. And I think along the way, Josh has become one of the leading experts on direct service delivery on this issue. We have, uh, secondly, we have Thomas Mitchell, and Thomas is a professor at Texas A&M University. Uh, he also there is, um, uh, helps co-lead a project on real estate and community development law. Uh, Professor Mitchell came to Texas A&M from the University of Wisconsin Law School where he had, he was a um, senior faculty member with a chair in law. Um, Thomas is also, um, we know him mostly as just a champion for heirs property and particularly around policy issues for heirs property. He's uh, widely uh, known to have uh, great authority on those issues. And uh, he has particularly been a champion of the heirs, uh, of, the, um, of the Uniform Petition Act and uh, has uh, been instrumental in getting that act passed in 18 jurisdictions now, 17 states and the Virgin Islands. And uh, so we're gonna hear more about that from him shortly. Uh, not only do we hear, we hear a lot about Thomas, but apparently the MacArthur Foundation has heard about him and recently made him a 2020 MacArthur Fellow. Congratulations, Thomas. Um, Thank you. We're very proud of you for that, but we also think you are bringing along, uh, and I think MacArthur probably intended to raise this issues, the issues that you deal with uh, to a national frame, and that's been very helpful to uh, all of us. So we're glad for that. Um, the session will last 45 minutes. Um, Josh is really going to focus on the individual issues of heirs property and dealing with heirs property families from a legal perspective. And then Thomas is going to focus more on state and federal policy uh, to support land retention, access to federal and state programs, and uh, towards the resolution of heirs property. Uh, we have a fairly, we're, Clifford, where are we with numbers of folks here? We are primarily going to people. Take, yep. Yeah, we're going to take your questions in the chat box. Um, so if you have questions, please be uh, put them in the chat box and Clifford's going to manage those questions and get them to us. Um, depending on how many people we have, we may open you up to uh, let you ask the question, but, uh, but put them in the chat box first and we'll, we'll manage the questions from there. So one caution here is that um, one thing that happens when Josh and Thomas make presentations is there are a lot of people out there needing individual advice on their own property around heirs property. Um, and it's a rare opportunity to get to see attorneys like this uh, to ask those questions, but we're not gonna be dealing with questions about individual cases today. We're really gonna go, go, go a little broader and look at, uh, at the questions that are, are, are more general in nature. And also neither Josh nor Thomas have the ability to don't have legal clinics outside coastal South Carolina. Uh, and so they're not really able to deal with uh, a lot of uh, inquiry about individual cases after this presentation. Um, so just be aware of, aware of that. So, uh, Josh, I'm going to call on you. Can you talk us, to us a little bit about um, your work on with individuals uh, around heirs property law? Sure, certainly. Thank you, Alan. Um, I know uh, there's what we're looking at is is the impact of direct legal services on heirs property owners, and from the center's perspective, you're looking at a process by which we're 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 preventing and protecting heirs property and heirs property families and promoting sustainable use of family land. The impact ultimately, what we hope is the result is, is clearing title and increasing the security and economic benefit of uh, family land and turning what maybe historically was a liability into an asset and allowing those families to fully utilize what most of us utilize when we own land or we own a home. Um, over the course of the last 15 years, the center has developed and implemented uh, a, a holistic strategy as far as delivering legal services to heirs property families and heirs property communities. Uh, and, and 
by holistic, I mean, when, when we're attacking that issue, uh, the problem of heirs property and, and the associated land loss, whether that be um, gentrification, whether it be uh, predatory development in the more rural areas, whether it be tax sales, whether it be forced partition sales due to intrafamily disagreement, um, the center has always addressed those uh, and addressed them not only realizing there's a need for an attorney, <laughs> an accessible, trustworthy, and affordable attorney to address the issue, uh, but also the, the social factors and the family dynamic issues that in invariably come up when, when you're dealing with not only a family on a particular case, but when you're beginning to engage a community or, or a region that, that maybe you, you heretofore have not been uh, present in or practicing in. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those things that I guess what I could share is the framework and maybe the best practices aspect of how the center as an organization uh, engage landowners and engage communities when we know there's heirs property issues. Um, it's, it, it truly is a uh, multifaceted problem and the center has always employed a, a multifaceted um, approach or strategy to that. And that was the case when we were five people working in five counties and I was the only attorney. And, and it's true now as we work to a much larger geographic area and we have soon to be six attorneys. Um, and, and it's really broken down into three key components when you're delivering direct legal services and you're entering into a community. Um, first and foremost, um, education and trust building. Uh, the truth of the matter is uh, the education component cannot be overstated. The idea of uh, providing trustworthy information to landowners and communities uh, on many levels, it, it, it dispels myths, it dispels certain uh, perceived protections that you keep your property and the heirs property form of ownership, you're somehow protected uh, against uh, intruders or, or land loss. Um, you're also looking at, it's, it's very important to be vetted and by community leaders. When we go into a community, the idea of creating trust or earning trust, you're not creating it, you're earning it. You're going into a community and you're engaging the community leaders. We don't go into a community and tell them what they need. Uh, we engage the community leaders. Uh, they tell us what they need. <laughs> they tell us when's the best time to convey this information. It might be Saturday morning at 9 a.m. We'll have an attorney there. We'll have a forester there if there's a, if there's a land utilization component. Um, the idea that that is not only needed, it's required if you're gonna have any degree of success when you're going into communities that have no reason to trust you as an attorney or as an organization, you have to be vetted. And, and, and if you do that, what happens is eventually you become trustworthy, right? I mean, what you say is trustworthy. You as an individual or as an individual attorney or outreach liaison or you as an organization eventually gain the trust. And, and there's a certain, um, there's a certain transition that happens where you go from being trusted to be in a trusted resource within the community. And usually what accompanies that sort of transition is action by folks within the community, whether it be a pastor calls you and invites you to a service or, or invites you to an, or, to, a, to an event or a community event, or uh, Ms. Johnson at the tax assessor's office engages somebody with heirs property and they, they give that person one of your flyers. Uh, you're trusted not only as to what you say, but you're trusted as, a, as, as an organization to be utilized to benefit the members of, of the community. Um, none of that involves a lawyer in the sense that you need legal, um, no, that you need a legal degree to accomplish, but it's important that lawyers be able to do that, particularly if they're going to be the face going into the community, and that's something the center has always done. Um, the two other components outside of education and trust building involve and by necessity uh, require that landowners and homeowners have access to trusted and affordable legal resource, i.e. attorneys. Um, you can educate folks as to what the issue is. You can dispel certain myths that may cause folks to uh, realize that the protections they thought they had keeping the property in this form of ownership aren't, aren't a reality. 
but unless you can provide the tools associated with bringing people out of that legal status of ownership, you're not doing a whole lot. And, and, and at the end of the day, it might not affect your trust, but it's going to affect the perception of your effectiveness as an organization or as an attorney. Um, prevention. Uh, the second component is prevention. Uh, and we're really talking about estate planning and succession planning. Um, the importance of wills. The center conducts free community wills clinics and where we go out on a Saturday and our staff attorneys, including myself, uh, go out and with some trusted uh, volunteer attorneys and draft wills all day on a Saturday. And uh, one, that's, that's a form of estate planning. And the, more li the, the fact that someone has a will makes it more likely that their estate will be administered, thereby removing the likelihood of the title being unclear or there being a title issue at a later time, uh, just based on the fact that a will does exist. And again, you're also creating goodwill and you're doing good work. Um, succession planning in the form of trust, LLCs, uh, uh, partition in kind agreements where families agree they want to divide the property up if there's enough acreage and that can be reached per an agreement. Um, and the third component outside of prevention is resolution. Uh, if you're dealing with multi-generational heirs property, we're dealing with two, three, four, five generations of heirs property or inher intestate inheritance that grows that tenancy and common ownership group to multiple, multiple folks, you're gonna need an attorney for purposes of quiet title actions, partition in kind actions. In other words, physical division of the property actions. Um, and, and at the end of the day, again, you need a lawyer. now. The, the center's in a very unique position that we can offer that because we have attorneys in-house. Uh, private attorneys are not involved in any way as far as our delivery of direct legal services. Um, I can tell you that one of the key components to this work, and particularly from the center standpoint and from my standpoint, not only as an attorney who handled a lot of the cases, but also as the COO who oversees the legal department and the outreach department and the forestry department at this point, um, since 2005, the center's resolved 278 cases with land totaling uh, a tax assessed value of $16.4 million. Almost without exception, every one of those cases involved some form of mediation. Whether that was a conversation, you know, on the front end that was relatively calm or whether that was a Saturday meeting at a, at a, at a church hall, uh, uh, where it can get a little heated when people are talking about uh, what they want and some of the feelings associated with, with uh, the land or the home. Um, mediation is a necessary component. We like to tell folks that our uh, attorneys expect and, and, and look forward to the mediation component and because it's part and parcel to resolving these issues if your primary focus is to retain the land. And the center is a preservation organization. We've never brought a case that ended in a forced partition sale in 15 years. Uh, that's because we're not going anywhere until we have a mediated written agreement. Uh, and, and otherwise, if you're in front of a judge with family land, with heirs property, and there's disagreement, you are at some level of vulnerability to a partition sale. Um, the Uniform Act does a wonderful job of uh, putting some safeguards there. It really does. It doesn't necessarily prevent it. Uh, the only way to be 100% sure is get there with an agreement. Um, at the end of the day, the, this sort of holistic approach is, uh, is necessary because that's what's needed if you're going to have any degree of sustained success in this area. Um, the, the trust, education, partnership, component uh, lends itself to getting folks in the door to allow you to stack success stories, which is exactly what you're going to do if you're looking at it from an on-ground perspective and you're going into a community and you're looking to become a trusted resource and a commodity to the landowners and homeowners there. And, and this holds true whether you're talking about 700 acres that might be utilized for ag or forestry or, or ecotourism or, or conservation easement, or you're talking about someone's uh, home you know, uh, downtown Charleston home that was uh, originally owned by someone who passed away in 1920. You know, uh, all those things are, are part and parcel to the heirs property problem and, and freeing that, that 16.4 million tax assessed value of that property is now a resource and is accessible to those landowners and homeowners as a resource as it should be. 
and um, there are a uh, there are a lot of uh, details and nuance that I'm le leaving out, obviously, as far as those components, just based on time. Uh, but again, I'll tell everyone my uh, email is on the the center's website, so certainly feel free to uh, to reach out to me if you if you'd like. So, Josh, we got a couple of questions that I think maybe you could address. Uh, one from Carolyn saying she's just wondering why. Uh, why can't someone with heirs property just get a quick claim deed? If someone lays claim to some insignificant portion of the property, won't they have to prove ownership? Sure. Um, well, the, I can give an answer that is related directly to South Carolina law. I don't know if Carolyn's from South Carolina, uh, but in South Carolina, the quick claim deed is just a deed that transfers whatever interest someone may have. Uh, it's not a general warranty deed. It's not a deed that warranties ownership. Uh, a quick claim uh, deed is, is a way to effectively transfer whatever interest you may have as the grantee in that deed. You're not being given any warranties. Um, at the end of the day, there are a couple of different ways that property ownership is tracked for purposes of clear title. Either you're going to purchase it or be given it and a deed will be recorded in the Register of Deeds office, or you're going to in, or you're going to pass it along by way of your estate, whether it's with a will or without a will. The administration of that state creates the record. That chain of title creates, uh, creates a record as to who the current owners are. That's what clear title is. Uh, the quick claim deeds that transfer back and forth that aren't related and fall in line with a, a perfected chain of title are going to result in just a hodgepodge and, and, and result in any landowner who wants to utilize any interest they own uh, being rebuffed by any kind of bank or any kind of organization that's going to require proof of ownership uh, because those deeds are just going to sort of spring up like wild onions <laughs> in a field. You know, they're not connected to anything that that conveys the chain of ownership. And that's really what we do in the legal sense. We're, we're recreating that, the record that was never, ex that never existed due to unadministered estates and, and things of that nature, if that. Yeah, here's one from uh, Jill that we hear, I've heard a lot, and it's sort of one that makes sense, but um, maybe there are things in this uh, law business that don't totally make sense. So this one is, from Jill, what remedies are available to heirs who financially maintain the property when the non-financially active heirs wish to claim their share? My state, Arkansas, has passed the Heirs Property Act. Yeah, I have no idea in the state of Arkansas. The, uh, that would be a question for an Arkansas attorney. I can tell you that in South Carolina, uh, the payment of taxes, the upkeep of the land is irrelevant as to ownership interests. And, and there's no acquiesce, you don't acquiesce or give up your ownership interests uh, and, 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 and by not participating in the upkeep financially or otherwise in South Carolina. So it'll turn now to Thomas Mitchell. And uh, Thomas, you're gonna take us out a little bit more broadly on, on policy uh, conversations. So uh, have at it. Okay, so Clifford, can you bring up the PowerPoint? So what I'm going to say is, you know, there has been significant land loss within disadvantaged communities, African American and other communities, especially communities of color. When I started my work on this 23, 24 years ago, um, this work was considered backwater, fringe, irrelevance. There were hardly any academics studying the issue. It got very little media coverage. Uh, there were, uh, you know, very few foundations interested uh, in this work. And the number of uh, public interest or legal aid organizations, there was a handful. Um, but um, what I describe this age as kind of a golden age, there's been in the last several years, far more academics and other researchers who have been studying a variety of issues with heirs property. The media has just gotten incredibly interested in this issue. I don't know, I've done something like 60 or 70 interviews over the last two years, just alone. Um, there's obviously others. And there's great organizations like the Center for Heirs Property Preservation in South Carolina, the Georgia Heirs Property Law Center that did not exist 16 years ago. Um, and then the last thing is when I started this work 23 years ago or, or so, the consensus was that uh, heirs property owners, because they fundamentally lacked political power and economic power and had little social capital, that there could be no law and policy solutions designed to benefit them. And uh, we're also now have seen uh, successes that, that people thought was impossible. 
So I'm going to talk about um, some issues of law and policy at the state level, some issues of law and policy at the federal level, some examples where the federal and state um, governmental entities are working hand in hand, and then some um, ideas of some additional things we need to do going forward. So I'm going to start off with some examples from the state level. I'll focus on the uh, model state statute that I was principally, I served as the principal drafter for. It's this Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. And it was designed to address this problem where in terms of heirs property, which is just a subset of what we call tenancy in common property, that's the official legal title, uh, which is the most prevalent form of what we call common real property ownership in the United States. Common real property ownership was where a group of people own property. Nobody in the group has any specific claim to any specific part of the property. What they have is a fractional undivided ownership in the entire property, like owning shares in a corporation, for example, is a good analogy. So the problem with partition law as it had developed over a time, it allowed any one of the common owners, the tenants in common, if you wanna say the heirs, to file this action, petition a court to request a forced sale of the property. And the court started routinely ordering the forced sale of the property, even when they could have easily ordered something like the physical division of the property, which ostensibly was supposed to be the primary remedy. The, um, so the Uniform Partition Act that, um, you know, when I started this work, uh, the consensus was that no state would pass it. Well, we're now up to 17 states and the U.S. Virgin Islands, as Alan mentioned. The, um, what's been uh, especially a shock to many people is um, they thought at most that we might get one or two states outside of the South, but we would meet stiff resistance in all the Southern states. Well, it turns out that eight of the 17 states that have passed or enacted into law the Uniform Partition Act are Southern states. And in 2020, we had three successes in the South, Florida, Virginia, and Mississippi, which frankly even took me by surprise. Um, so, the, you know, so the act is specifically designed to enhance property rights protections for heirs property owners, to limit the amount of these forced partition sales that get ordered, or at least to then uh, limit the negative economic impact of these sales. So instead of a, a share of sales, what we call, or sometimes an auction sale, um, is that produces a buyer sale price. The Uniform Act includes a new sales mechanism that very much uh, mirrors how people typically sell property. A real estate broker is appointed, they list the property for its appraised value, there's no artificial time limits. People can make bids contingent on getting financing. They can expect the property. None of the things that happen in these auctions or the share of sales. So what I was always hoping was that, you know, A, there would be such a uniform act that, um, that with the success we would have with that, that it could be generative of other uh, changes in legal reform, right? We've now, uh, looks like we're making some progress in accomplishing that. So if you go back to the uh, original slide, Clifford, as a result of the success of the Uniform Partition Act, which really was an outlier for this organization called the Uniform Law Commission, which has had the longest history in terms of drafting model state statutes, 128 years, 450 of their model state statutes. Um, but as a result of the success of the Partition Act, I was able to convince them to accept a second proposal that they're evaluating right now that would make changes to some of the rules about uh, heirs, property owners, or tenants in common who want to change their form of ownership to something that is more stable, more rational, allocates rights and responsibilities in a better way between the common owners. Um, and so we're gonna find out soon. They've, um, they set up a study committee but I think it's highly likely that they will then set up a committee to draft such uh, an act. So that's, that's kind of at the, uh, at, at the state level. One of the things, if you, if you looked at that map of the states that have been passed it, we've had passage in uh, every region of the country from Hawaii to Florida, from Connecticut to Montana and New Mexico, three Midwestern states in between. And you know, state legislatures don't just pass bills because it's a fun thing to do. What they're responding to is they're hearing from the ground that their constituents 
are expressing that they got this problem. So what I often said is, is African Americans disproportionately have heirs property problems, but they're not exclusive, right? You find this in Appalachia among poor whites, you find it among Native Hawaiians and Native Americans, you find it among Latinos in the Southwest, for example. So it's a very widespread problem. And it's also a problem that's not just a rural problem. Uh, as I've been, I was trying to tell people for years, it's, it's, a, it's a rural and urban problem. It's a function of people who don't make wills, um, who have uh, low income or low wealth, whose property ends up in a rapidly appreciating area, whether on the urban fringe in terms of rural properties or in a city with gentrification, and typically the owners lack access to affordable legal services. None of those factors screams out purely rural or purely urban. And to kind of put a fine point on that, one of our, uh, the states where we got it enacted into law in 2019 was New York, after an investigative reporter pointed out, or was able, in her um, uh, investigative reporting for a major television station in New York City, uncovered the fact that there had been major abuse of partition law by real estate speculators preying upon African-American families in every area of New York, from Harlem to Queens to, uh, to Brooklyn, um, et cetera. So that's just in terms of like who is impacted by heirs property, right? Um, okay, so next slide, Clifford. The, um, just, just quickly, these are the three primary remedies of the Uniform Act. It uh, enables people to uh, buy out those who want to seek a forced sale of the property in their fellow, uh, some fellow common owner. It, uh, it builds enhanced property rights by making courts uh, specifically recognize that there's value to land besides economic value. There's family heritage, there's cultural significance, there's historical value. There's value about how people are using the property and if they can't use it, what would be the negative impacts, including for basic shelter. So the courts have to take into account if they're gonna order a forced sale. Is there somebody using the property for basic shelter that if the property was forcibly sold, it would severely reduce the quality of their housing, maybe even render them homeless. Courts didn't have to take into account any of those non-economic factors before the Uniform Partition Act, but now in the states that have passed it, they have to. And the final thing is to recognize that in some cases, the fairest remedy is a forced sale. As I indicated, this is an urban problem. So if you're dealing with a brownstone in Harlem and you got 40 heirs, you're not gonna be able to divide that brownstone. So the fairest remedy, if the family couldn't work out an agreement among themselves, is to sell it. But the, 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 the sales procedures I described um, significantly um, will increase the economic returns on a forced sale, meaning that the families will then retain a much higher percentage of their real estate wealth. And for African-Americans and Latinos, for example, the, uh, their asset portfolios are disproportionately consist of their real estate, their real property holdings. So the forced sales of their heirs' property at these fire sale prices really had a devastating impact on their overall asset portfolios. And that last provision tries to address that. Clifford, can I get the next slide? All right, so there's one of the, uh, our biggest developments in the last two years that has helped us break through in states that we had literally no chance was the 2018 Federal Farm Bill and provisions that were incorporated in that bill from something called the Fair Access for Farmers and Ranchers Act, sponsored on the Senate side by Senator Tim Scott and Doug Jones uh, from South Carolina, Alabama, and uh, Representative Fudge from Ohio, I believe, on the House side. The, uh, uh, very interesting how the uh, Congress structured this bill. There are some enhanced benefits purely uh, at the federal level within the USDA. Um, heirs property owners have the greater ability to get something as is really in the weeds called a farm number. You need a farm number to participate in a huge range of USDA programs from lending to disaster relief to conservation programs. But before this act, heirs property owners needed clear title and because so many of them didn't have it, they were basically prevented from getting the farm number and participating in these programs. The farm bill does a workaround. And then it also has a small pilot program to enable families to access a revolving loan program where they can get a loan on a low interest rate and good terms, basically to restructure their ownership to something that's a much more viable and stable and rational form of common ownership. Um, and so that they can get a will or some other estate plan 
the key feature of the Farm Bill for, for the purposes at the state level is the Farm Bill specifically references this Uniform Partition of Bearish Property Act, and it gives incentives to states that have not enacted it into law to do so because family farmers and ranchers who own heirs property, if they are located in states that have passed the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act, they are entitled to a broader set of USDA benefits than family farmers and ranchers in states that own, that, who own heirs property in states that have not passed it. And as a direct result of that feature of the Farm Bill, as I indicated, we were able to break through in the last two years in Illinois, Florida, Mississippi, and Virginia, states that we had zero chance before the Farm Bill. Can I get the next slide? All right, so there's, it, Josh has already talked about this problem of clear title, right? And it has huge implications, right? So if you lack clear title to your property, you are gonna be shut out from getting loans from commercial lenders that would require your property as collateral for that loan. It then also causes problems in terms of being able to access a range, a wide range of state and federal uh, governmental programs. At the federal level, we're talking to USDA, FEMA, HUD, and potentially others. Uh, at the state level, there's all kinds of organizations. This, this, this link, if this uh, PowerPoint gets shared, is from Georgia, where um, a, a group of kind of low-income uh, African-Americans who were homeowners who had dilapidated homes had applied for uh, a program through the Georgia Community Affairs Department or Department of Community Affairs that would give grants to families who had dilapidated housing to upgrade, but it required clear title. And at the end of the day, this, this family, I think the town was called Portersville, they, nobody was eligible because they didn't have clear title. Um, and so they haven't been able to do anything to upgrade their quality of their, of their homes. Can I get the next one? So one of the points, and I can go into this, so I'll just kind of do a quick over. There's, there's a massive lack of critical data that's been collected on uh, African-American and other uh, landowners of color. Uh, there's a huge deficit in the data at the state and federal level in terms of heirs property ownership. So just from a policy perspective, this is something I regularly mention to state uh, elected officials and policymakers and federal elected officials and policymakers, is that if we're going to have better policy in this area, the quality and the amount of the data and the analysis of that data have to be substantially upgraded. The Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act almost didn't happen because typically for African American land ownership in this country, the media, academics, they rely upon the census of agriculture. Unfortunately, the census of agriculture, most people in the media and the public and academia don't understand what the methodology that is used in the census of agriculture. The census of agriculture does not, with respect to farmers, uh, purport to capture all of the agricultural land uh, any racial or ethnic group owns, which most people don't understand. What it captures is land that is owned by uh, people who have active farm operations. Unfortunately, or you know, the reality is in the African American community is maybe in 1910 or 1920, most black families that own agricultural land were actively farming it. In 2020, that's just not true. There are many black families that own agricultural land that once was an active farm operation, but now the family is renting to a white farmer usually or using for some non-agricultural uh, purpose, or they're just letting it lie fallow. None of that acreage is captured by the USDA's uh, twice a decade census of agriculture. So when I began proposing that there be a change in this law, this Uniform Law Commission that I mentioned, they were looking at data from the 1997 agricultural census that showed that there was 1.5 million, million acres of uh, black farmland uh, still in existence, and that was down from a high of about somewhere between 16 and 20 million acres in 1910. And their viewpoint was it's too late. The horse is out of the barn. This is a group of uh, landowners that are on the verge of extinction. And I had to show them that fortunately the USDA did a subsequent study two years later building on the census of agriculture. And that study showed that in fact, African-Americans own 7.6 million acres of land that was valued at $14.5 billion. Unfortunately, the USDA has not done another study like this 1999 study. So there's a critical need for that to be done. I think I have one last slide. 
So there is this critical lack of access to affordable legal services. And it's why people like Josh and I, when we do forums like this, we usually get crushed afterwards by people with their individual families' problems. Um, you know, I have no bandwidth. I'm, I'm, I don't run a legal aid organization. I'm a law professor who does policy work. But there's, you know, every chance I get, I mention this issue to relevant stakeholders in the federal government, at state governments, to foundations, um, and there's a role to play for law firms. One other thing I say at, at a level, if we're dealing with African-American farmers, one of the com, uh, confounding or one of the uh, com, uh, factors that compounds this problem is that there's a critical lack of access to or lack of supply of African-American lawyers in this country. African-Americans are about 13 and percent of the population, but only 5% of attorneys in the United States are African-American. And to make it worse, most there are very few African-American attorneys in the grand scheme of things that practice in the areas that implicate wealth building or wealth preservation, tax law, the law governing wills, trust in the states, um, real estate law, uh, for example. I mean, African-American attorneys tend to be overrepresented in criminal law. Now, there's a critical need for African-American criminal lawyers. There's not enough, but, but because we have so few African-American attorneys who have what we call transactional uh, practices, it severely undermines the ability of, um, of African, the African-American community to, to uh, tap at least those services from people from their own community. So I think on that, I'll wrap up. Hey, thank you guys, that was, that was great. We do have a, a question here that might go back to you, Thomas, which is uh, from uh, Sean, who's asking, uh, what would be on the 2023 Farm Bill wish list related to heirs, property, and land retention? Okay, so one of the things I'm, uh, I, I will tell you is, and I'm not able to quite make this public, um, but either like today, this afternoon, I don't know if the bill dropped this afternoon. If it didn't drop this afternoon, it's gonna drop tomorrow. We There's, have a little suspense here in our, in our presentation. Now. Yeah, you, so you should be on the lookout for a bill that will be introduced by a United States Senator who was a presidential candidate on the Democratic side, right? He didn't become the nominee, but so I would look out for that bill. That, that bill represents the most robust attempt to deal with uh, land ownership among disadvantaged communities uh, for uh, black farmers, for those who want to, from disadvantaged communities who want to get into farming. So, um, you know, so if, if, if I had a wish list of things in the farm bill, it would address the kind of historic discrimination and uh, systemic discrimination within the USDA that did not start, stop in the, in the settlement of this Pigford versus Blickman case, which was the largest class um, action uh, that African Americans have brought, sorry, my dog's in the back, um, you, you know, against the US government. The, um, you know, so there's up there, there's still remaining issues to be addressed there. It would address this issue of uh, having the um, federal government play a, a substantial role in trying to increase access to legal services. Um, it would further kind of incentivize uh, state um, statutes like consistent with how the farm bill was structured, um, as I indicated with the Uniform Partition Act. It would deal with uh, trying to substantially improve the data collection that bears upon um, uh, farmers of different racial and ethnic groups and, and gender. Um, it would be, um, um, you know, so, and it would also uh, try to uh, ensure that there was better data collected, um, also kind of at a fine grain level about heirs property owner, although that's not purely a federal issue, that's also kind of a, a state issue. So those are some of the things, and I'm sorry, like none of my family members seem to get that my dog is, dog, is barking. Um, it's dog uh, dinner time. Yeah, so. So I've got a question for both of you. One is uh, in the efforts in the states, various states to pass the Uniform Petition Act, who has been critical in the coalitions to try and get that done? And is, has the organizing around that uh, helped advance the the networks of people who are now engaged in thinking about this issue in South Carolina, Josh, what's happening on that and then go to Thomas. On South Carolina, obviously, uh, as Thomas mentioned earlier, uh, when he first uh, contacted me, my hair was, was uh, 
much darker and he had hair and that's quoting him so uh, uh when we uh, engaged and, and we also worked closely with south carolina appleseed uh in in attempts to to get the uniform act passed um we actually were uh we had good contributions from the state real estate bar in south carolina it passed unanimously we had one dissenting vote uh and that was it and uh and i, I think that took a lot of folks by surprise uh, Thomas flew in, and and Jen, Dr. Stevens and I uh, appeared at a uh, at a legislative uh, caucus, and, and we also uh, a subcommittee as well presented some educational materials. Uh, so it went really smoothly. But in the sense of also South Carolina having that law passed, uh, there's Property Retention Coalition is a group of uh, organizations who, uh, who 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 address this issue across a. Uh, uh, a wide, a wide swath of the United States with individual uh, organizations throughout the country, uh, as well as uh, the South, uh, uh, the center is is part of the uh, Sustainable Forestry Land Retention Network, which uh, is also dedicated to land, you know, obviously land retention as well as land utilization uh, by way of, uh, of uh, sustainable forestry or sustainable land use, whether it be ag or forestry. Uh, so, uh, out of the out of the uh, the beginnings that that indicated you know uh, getting the, the uniform law passed in South Carolina, I can tell you just from on the ground standpoint, it basically took out for to a large extent the low level predatory developers, and, and you're talking about small small line folks who would go and buy properties at tax sales or secure a quick claim deed from an individual heir and then bring a forced partition sale realizing that under the old system, uh, the other heirs may or may not come forward. The courts are going to make a, a, a one-off decision based on the law at the time. This pecuniary test that says, uh, is, uh, is your individual interest worth, worth more as part of a whole versus being uh, subdivided by way of a partition in kind, and you're going to lose that every time. So then it was sold at auction for, if at best, 50% of the value of the land. So I can't overstate what the Uniform Act has done for purposes of of removing that it hasn't removed predatory development but what it has done is make it a lot higher uh fence to navigate if you're going to go that route and some people and they better have a nice uh a nice bankroll if they're going to do it so we've taken out a lot of the lower level now there's still a lot of challenges that are unrelated to predatory development but uh but yeah, the Uniform Act has been a, a, a wonderful thing, in my opinion, for South Carolina. Yeah, and I think the key, what, what I love about this work, I mean, obviously it's kind of my life's work, is that um, we have employed both what I call a uh, top-down strategy. So we have the ABA behind us. We have this Uniform Law Commission, which you probably have never heard of, but they're an incredibly powerful organization. We have uh, this, um, you know, other kind of, Sometimes we get the state bar when we, when we get them on our side, um, they're kind of powerful, but it's also very much bottom up. And so the, that was both in the drafting of the act, right? So I tried to bring in all kinds of organizations, including these ones that Josh referred to, right? From this heirs property retention coalition. So that as we were drafting the act, it could be actually be informed by well, what was happening on the ground, right? Uh, not just in terms of a law professor doing the research I could do from afar. But the as we've been going across the country and getting this enacted into law, um, what's been nice is initially it was very much focused on like three people who were kind of leading the charge. One is the chief counsel for the Uniform Law Commission. So you can Google Uniform Law Commission. His name is Benjamin Orzeski. One was the guy who was the coordinator for the Sarah's Property Retention Coalition is a public interest attorney in Alabama named John Pollock. And then there was me. And so we would like, you know, get together and try to figure out where do we have an opportunity in the next year? And we pick a couple of states and we try to work all our networks. Um, but as, it's, as the success started to build and the um, knowledge about this problem started to build, you know, we've had individuals who've taken it upon themselves in individual states to lead the effort. There's a woman, Karama Neal, who did that uh, incredible yeoman's work in Arkansas and sponsored you know, community radio shows, newsletters, uh, Facebook page. It was amazing the work that she did. Um, and we got it passed there a few years ago unanimously. Um, or in the last couple of years in Virginia and in uh, Florida, 
amazing kind of multiracial, multi-sectoral coalitions formed um, that they were just on point. They met like monthly, sometimes more than that. There were assignments for everybody in the group, including me. Um, and in, in both Florida and Virginia, it happened to be primarily led by um, the environmental community, the land trust community in Virginia, the um, uh, environmental aspect in Florida that worked, it was Defenders of Wildlife, which initially was counterintuitive to me about their great interest. But, you know, it was, it was this incredibly organized coalition um, that had a, you know, that worked over the course of a year, had regular meetings, <laughs> regular homework assignments, um, and so I would, you know, if anybody's interested, I can get you in touch with some of the leaders of those uh, coalitions. Um, and so I think it's just essential, um, as opposed to, uh, you know, us getting intro uh, an introduction into a state with no idea about, you know, what's with no ground game, with nobody we can test have testify that can uh, testify that there's actually a problem. So there's now plenty of examples of various kind of grassroots or coalitions that have now formed. Um, and I'd be happy if anybody's interested offline to put you in touch with uh, those groups. I mean, in New York in 2019, we had an amazing coalition um, led by the New York City Bar Association. Um, so anyway, that's, um, you know, that's what I, what I would recommend. Clifford, I think our time has run out. And I, so I wanna thank, uh, thank our uh, panelists, Josh and Thomas, thank you very much for your wisdom, bringing it forward to us. And Clifford, I think you might have some instructions for us for later on. Definitely. Um, uh, first off, we'll be sharing out recordings of these sessions uh, along with all the other recordings um, uh, in a couple of days. Give us a couple of days. We'll compile all that stuff and get it out to you via email. But we've got a 30 minute break uh, get a bite to eat, uh, some snacks or a, um, a drink, and uh, join us at 6 p.m. for our special event with Chuck Lavelle, uh, uh, America's Forest with Chuck Lavelle. So um, I just sent an email that should be hitting your inbox with the link there. The link is also in the agenda. Uh, and um, so please I'll go ahead and, and, and put that in the, in the chat here as well. You can click on it now. Uh, it, the room won't be open for a couple of minutes, but it'll open once you click on it. It'll open automatically. So in the uh, Clifford, in, I want to add a little bit of incentive here. We've got Yvonne Knight Carter with us in this room, uh, who's the oh, chair of the yeah. board of the Center for Heirs Property Preservation. Wants a happy birthday to the center to you, and also Yvonne Knight Carter. If you come back and see that film, you're going to get to see her sing and play the piano uh, along with Chuck Lavelle, which is pretty special. So, <laughs> Yvonne, we look forward to seeing you in a few minutes. <laughs> Hey, uh, Al, can, can I say one thing? Sure. Uh, there's been like this great media coverage I mentioned in the last couple of years. So if anybody wants to see a really great investigative report in the rural context, rural Southern, Vice, uh, that, which airs on Showtime, did this really great investigative report. It's called Losing Ground. It's now, now available on YouTube under Vice News. So if you put in Vice News, YouTube, Losing Ground, amazing, amazing investigative report. The second one is that makes the point about how this is an urban issue is was done by an investigative reporter for one of the major television stations in New York City in 2019, showing how it impacts in urban context, especially uh, how real estate speculators were preying upon African American owners. The name of that investigative report, if you Google going, going, gone, you put in NY1, the number one, the reporter was Lydia, L-Y-D-I-A, last name Hugh, H-U. Amazing, amazing investigative report. Without her report, we never would have gotten New York. Great. Thanks, you guys. Everybody. at 6 o'clock. Yep, see, see everybody soon. <laughs>